Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je m'appelle Shirley Anas. Je suis la directrice générale des communications au ministère de la Justice. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's news conference regarding the Senate passing of Bill C-15, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act in the Senate. I acknowledge with gratitude that we are starting this press conference from the traditional territory of the Algonquin peoples. Given that so much of what we do is now taking place virtually, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional territories on which you may be. We are joined today by the Honorable David Lametti, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, the Honorable Carolyn Bennett, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, National Chief Perry Belgard, Assembly of First Nations, Natan Obed, President of the Inuit Tapirat Kanatami, David Chartrand, National Spokesperson, Métis National Council, and Chief and Dr. Wilton Lily Child, who, if you are not aware, was instrumental in the work of Indigenous peoples worldwide to advocate for and establish the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. To start this event in a good way, we are joined by Elders Verna McGregor, Albert McLeod, Mika Kakuduk, and Verna de Montigny. We'll have an opportunity to hear short opening remarks from each of our guests. Then we will go to a Q&A over the phone line. As usual, we will go to one question and one follow-up. Le format est d'une question et avec une suivi. Si vous, ve- si vous pouvez poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix, feel free to ask your question in either official language. I would like to now turn to Algonquin Anishinaabe elder, Verna McGregor from Kitigan Zibi, who will open our event. Elder McGregor. Miigwech. Kweka kina. Hello, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, traditional lands here, which Ottawa Gatineau forms part of. Uh, really quickly for us, I always say this, uh, the significance of Ottawa and probably the nation's capital is that for us, we were known for the birch bark canoe, and we would meet in the summers at the Chaudière. And why? Because that's the confluence of the rivers coming together from the four directions, similar to the medicine wheel that I have here. And uh, there's many teachings to that, but at the center always represents also the Negro balance. So here we are on this historic day also, and hopefully that this passing of this uh, UNDRIP United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People also moves us closer to balance. Because again, for us, we were also one of the first to meet the, the newcomers to the land here, more importantly, uh, Samuel de Champlain. And again, it, it's also it's always been this uh, clash of understanding, and here we are. So again, this legislation may bring us forward to this understanding. And I also have a picture here of also um, my ancestor, William Kamanda, and he's holding the wampum belt. And this is the sharing belt of 1701. And the understanding of that was that that there'd be a sharing of the lands and resources in three equal parts with the British and the French that uh, the crown here. So again, that didn't happen with colonization, but again, to here we are with this legislation and hopefully that moves us forward to this, to that understanding. So I'm gonna say a quick prayer in Anishinaabe language to honor our ancestors and to honor everybody. So I say, COVID-19. 
and just got the great day seaman here in Abigas. You got John Jacquina and West Seasuck. Now we got a jig, the Madigajik, the Missile Jig, the Mudigajik, me Jim with Jack Cuckina, good Schwen Mishnon and Abigas. Mom, the game, me great John Jane and Jenna went dog and I didn't as well go on she. No, no, come as none and show him sin on a shit. And don't didn't as well go on Jane and up no Jishuk. Schwen Mishnon and Abigas. Mia, me great, me great, me great, me great. And then I'm just thank you for coming here today. And I wish you well. I thank all and also the the air, the, the fire, and the and the uh, water, because all four elements are important to sustain life. And we are all. And one of the teachings is that we're also given. Uh, all people were given the teachings also to look after the earth. So I say I send you good wishes and I say congratulations, everyone. Miigwech, merci. Thank you. Thank you, Elder McGregor. I would like to now turn to Elder and Two-Spirit Advocate Albert McLeod from the Nisi Chalwe Asik Cree Nation and the Métis Community of Norway House for his opening word. Elder McLeod? Thank you and welcome everyone uh, this morning to this circle. Uh, as we are instructed by our elders and knowledge keepers, uh, we know as humans we don't do this work alone. So we are guided to acknowledge that part of the natural world, the spirits of our ancestors who have guided us on this journey together to where we are today. Also, it is a time of the summer solstice when the sun is at its highest and we get to go on the land to pick the medicines, to gather the food, and also to gather uh, the uh, uh, animals that we use for our clothing and for our food. And we're told to acknowledge that part of the natural world, to acknowledge and honor through the tobacco that is being offered today, as well as I'd like to thank Verna for this much, in that we're instructed to purify ourselves in recognition that these spirits will present themselves today as we do this work. So we are told to turn to the east to acknowledge and honor that doorway that brings the different winds, the south to honor and acknowledge those winds that bring change, to the west to honor and acknowledge those winds that bring change, to the north to honor and acknowledge those winds that bring change. And is this just change today that we are all embarking on this journey together? And I want to acknowledge Wilton Little Child for his long journey in guiding us to where we are today about our inalienable and inherent rights as Indigenous people, our connection to the land that gives us life, our philosophies that guide us and have been here for thousands of years. So I am in Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis. I live on the Red River about a block away from where Louis Riel actually had a plot of land. So I think it is, you know, that all of the spirits have aligned for this day that uh, we come together to do this work uh, as we seek to be human. And it is a journey that we are all on, whether we are Indigenous or non-Indigenous on this land. <clears throat> as well, we look to the earth the fifth direction, the earth that gives us life. We look up to the sky, the spirit world that guides us. And finally, the seventh direction is the circle of humanity, which is all of us today. That we weave ourselves into this world, into this dimension. And we complete that full circle of life today uh, to do this very difficult work of learning what it is to be human, which. Thank you so much, Elder McLeod. I would like to now turn to Elder Mika Kakudluk, originally from Payavik, Nunavut, who will light the kulik and, and provide opening words. Elder Mika? Um, I'm not sure if my voice is too loud or echoey. 
It is fine, Elder Mika. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Piyanami, piyanami kulita pa na katawul na kama, matur sa katawul na kama. Thank you for allowing me to be here to open this uh, um, very important meeting. I'm going to start off with my uh, lighting my pulla pulla ka ikumasak ikumasalagat ko igaya ko siya ko so kain ma inu inu luta nakilio ko siya katalaw sa mga tigo kauma how much could you give you? Who 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 could you give Inuit used it to survive, to light it, keep it, to keep their stems warm, to cook with, especially in the long winter months. It would keep us warm, and that. Traditionally, the women, it would be women's job, but at times, men would also use a smaller pull up when they're out hunting. So it was used for both. And in one time in my lifetime, when we were introduced to electricity, we disowned it. We didn't use it anymore as if it was not part of our life. And not too long ago, I started relearning about the pulla, the traditional oil lamp when I'm lighting. And that I'm very happy that even though some of the other issues for Inuit were left, were disowned, that we are able to get, get them back. And this is one of the great example what I'm lighting that it, it's back. We can relearn it. And I believe what the meeting is about, about the law or the, the, the rules within the Canada. Tana Astualo Pullaga Ikumasakilogo Tuan Katiakto Patimeltium Tunimana Ulla Vianami Kulu Ilagiyo Tiago Nama Amatako Justice of Canada Milke Imagine illo, illegal illo, illegal to tell Javan Namakuyan, the meeting and the tumor. Tame Makala, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Mika. I would like to now turn to Metis Elder Verna de Montigny from Fulliard's Corner or Le Coin, who will provide opening prayers. Merci. I would just like to say good morning to everybody and uh, thank the elders before me, Verna, Albert, and Mika. 
their beautiful prayers. This morning, I would just like to thank the Creator for waking up to another day and protecting us while we sleep. Also, to thank Mother Earth for always being here for us and providing for us everything that we need, all our needs. I would like to ask our ancestors to be with us and walk with us today on this honorable day we are to hear and see. I'd like to ask for a blessing for all our families. And always, I like to keep in our prayers things that are happening in our world today, the little children that never made it home, the COVID on Mother Earth right now. I'd like to ask for a healing hand to be placed on the families of those children and a healing hand placed on Mother Earth because she's suffering at the moment. And I always pray for her. The Bunnavel was to Bill C. Fifteen. Marci a Kunskayan for a not journey. Kakio, a Kimonskayak, a Knamiak. Marci, tell Mamma Satermina, what I had for Kenan to town. We quetch him out, Moshomananic, Kokomananic, to which he quayak, which moved that chick of a Kenananos. Mina de Gretchkem on Abu Kerr, would you? Kachamanetto. Kakio de Kayak. We are yak. Benimi yak. Or not for me, Mina. The Kakio de Kayachik. Oma Anush Betena, the announcement, which did Dalstanat, a keepers be chachik. In Portan, my Porkinan. Kakio cannot start on an Anush. The announcement we're about to hear today from the Senate, the passing of the Senate of Bill C-15. It's important for us today, let us keep in mind that with this bill, we can work in unity to protect, to promote, and the rights to be recognized, not only of our people, but for everyone. As always, Lord, I'd like to close in prayer. A, bless a blessing, a special blessing for the elderly, the children, the sick, the ones who are suffering, place a healing hand on them. And for the little children that were found, let their spirit go home and be in peace. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Je cède maintenant la parole à l'honorable Minister Lemetti, who will say a few words. Minister Lemetti, over to you. Hello, bonjour. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the Algonquin Anishinaabe people from whose traditional territories I am joining you today. Thank you to all the four elders uh, for beginning uh, and uh, eventually closing this event in a good way. I'm pleased to join the Honorable Carolyn Bennett, Chief Dr. Wilton Littlechild, National Chief Perry Belgard, President Natan Obed, and Vice President David Chartrand. Mercredi a été une journée importante pour le Canada, pour les peuples autochtones, pour la réconciliation. Le processus législatif du projet de loi C-15 est maintenant terminé. Il ne manque que la sanction royale avant qu'il ne devienne loi. L'adoption vient après les moments particulièrement difficiles des dernières semaines. I will admit that I'm still processing the news from Kamloops, the unmarked graves of the 215 children at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. This discovery reflects a tragic and shameful part of Canada's history that continues to haunt us to this day. And it underscores the work we need to do as a country to fully understand, acknowledge, and respond to the national tragedy of residential schools. We have to address the legacy of injustices, including systemic racism and discrimination that continue to hold back Indigenous peoples across Canada. It's easy to be pessimistic or cynical about the future of reconciliation, but I believe the passage of C-15 represents a sign of progress and a reason to be optimistic. This moment has many authors, and I want to start by acknowledging the dedication and the vision of Indigenous leaders across Canada. 
I want to honor the many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis leaders who advocated for this legislation to implement the Declaration and whose efforts have led us today. In particular, Chief Dr. Wilton Littlechild, one of the architects of the Declaration and a powerful voice for its implementation here in Canada. Mon ancien collègue Romeo Saganache, qui a présenté le projet de loi C-262, ayant servi de fondation à l'élaboration du projet de loi C-15. Je remercie le chef national Perry Bellegarde, le président Nathan Obed et le vice-président David Chartrand de leur plaidoyerie et leurs efforts pour la reconnaissance des droits des peuples autochtones. I want to thank modern treaty and self-governing nations, rights holders, treaty partners, Indigenous youth, and national and regional Indigenous organizations, including those representing Indigenous women, and to spirit and gender diverse people. Of my, my many colleagues in the House of Commons, I want to single out two in particular, Mike McLeod and Jaime Batiste for their leadership. And I want to thank Sackage Henderson for her, his inspiration over all of these years. Your invaluable help helped shape C-15. Our work together is not over, it's just beginning. I believe that the passage of Bill C-15 will provide the foundation for transformational change in Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. I have heard the critics who think this bill is an empty gesture. It is not. Once law, Bill C-15 will require the Government of Canada to work in partnership with Indigenous peoples to align federal laws, policies, and practices with the Declaration. Le préambule du projet de loi guidera ce travail, soit reconnaître que nos relations sont fondées sur les droits inhérents à l'autodétermination et à l'autonomie gouvernementale. Reconnaître l'importance du respect des traités et des accords et souligner la nécessité de tenir compte de la diversité existante au sein des peuples autochtones lorsque nous mettons les mesures législatives en œuvre. I know there is some impatience among, amongst Indigenous peoples to get going on all this. I have heard it from all three leaders speaking today, but that time has come. Together, we will develop the action plan and we will lay out the next steps for the implementation of the Declaration. Engagement will be broad and inclusive and through cooperation and collaboration with Indigenous partners. We will identify the priorities to shape both the action plan and the measures for aligning federal laws with the Declaration. Notre passé et notre présent pèsent lourd devant le travail qui nous attend. Mais nous avons l'opportunité de léguer un héritage d'espoir et de renouveau aux générations qui nous suivront. Moving together is going to take a lot of hard work. There are going to be good days and there are going to be difficult days. But I'm an optimist. As we begin this process, we're guided by the words of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Canadians must do more than just talk about reconciliation. We must learn how to practice reconciliation in our everyday lives, within ourselves and our families, and in our communities, governments, places of worship, schools, and workplaces. C15 gives us a roadmap that will help us, that will help show us a way to a better Canada. We look forward to royal assent and to the start of a new chapter in our collective history, one that we will write together. Megwich, Nakarmik, Marci, Niawan, Chinskumatan, hi hi. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister Lamedi. Je cède maintenant la parole à l'honorable Ministre Bennett, who will say a few words. Kwe kwe, Udlakut, Tansi, hello, bonjour. Je me joins à vous aujourd'hui des territoires traditionnels des Mississaugas of the Credit, où nous honorons tous les peuples autochtones qui ont pagayé ces eaux et dans les moccasins ont parcouru ces terres. Thank you so much to Elder Vernon McGregor, Elder Albert McLeod, Elder Mika Kudluk, et Elder Verna de Montigny for starting us in such a good way today. I'm pleased to also be joining you virtually alongside my colleague, David Lametti, National Chief Belgard, 
President Obed, National Spokesperson and Vice President Chartrand, and Chief Willie Littlechild. As we've been reminded over these, these past difficult weeks, Canada has a long way to go to right past wrongs and bring an end to the systemic violence, racism, and discrimination experienced by First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. La mise en œuvre de la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones nous rapprochera de cet objectif commun. Il s'agit d'un pas en avant essentiel pour affirmer, protéger et faire respecter les droits humains des peuples, familles et communautés autochtones à travers le pays. In 2016, I was honored to be at the United Nations to update Canada's position to a full endorsement of the declaration. We began engaging with First Nations, Inuit and Métis on the implementation of rights of Indigenous peoples. Today, talks have happened at over 150 discussion tables representing more than 500 Indigenous communities to advance Indigenous rights to self-determination. This builds upon the decades of work of modern treaty partners, some of governing First Nations and Inuit land claim partners, whose agreements bring to life the core elements of the Declaration. Their voice and guidance throughout the process have been invaluable. In the last Parliament, we supported Romeo Saganash's Bill 262, which, although it passed in the House of Commons, was not passed in the Senate. In December 2020, we introduced legislation to implement the Declaration and continued working with National Indigenous Organizations, Modern Treaty Partners, Self-Governing Nations, Rights Holders, Indigenous Youth, Women, Gender Diverse, and Two-Spirit People, as well as countless regional Indigenous organizations. Mercredi soir, après cinq ans de travail, le Senat a adopté Le projet de loi C-15, la loi sur la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Nous attendons maintenant la san sanction royale pour inscrire la Déclaration dans nos lois. Ce projet de loi fournit une feuille de route pour que le gouvernement et les peuples autochtones travaillent ensemble à la mise en œuvre complète euh, de la Déclaration. The Act affirms the human rights of Indigenous people in Canada. It means addressing the racism and discrimination Indigenous people and, and two-spirit and gender-diverse people face every day. It means protecting Indigenous language, culture, and traditional lands, and it means supporting communities on the path to self-determination and self-government. It means building a brighter future, for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples for generations to come. En travaillant main dans la main avec les peuples autochtones, nous mettons en œuvre les droits de l'article 35 et nous respectons le principe fondamental « rien sur nous sans nous ». La Commission de la de Vérité et de la Réconciliation et l'enquête nationale sur les femmes et les filles autochtones disparues et assassinées ont toutes deux demandé au gouvernement fédéral de mettre en œuvre la Déclaration comme cadre de la réconciliation. Today, I am pleased that we are moving forward on those vital calls to action and calls for justice. Together, we are continuing to walk the path of reconciliation. In closing, I would like to express my thanks to the Indigenous organizations, governments, and grassroots groups who have been advocating for the Declaration for decades at home and abroad. And I'm so pleased that Dr. Wilton Littlechild is able to be with us today. Dr. Littlechild, your leadership has been invaluable to getting to us to this day. The members of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Indigenous and Northern Affairs and the S Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples for their expedient study of the bill. And all members of the House and Senate who voted in favour of the declaration, allowing it to pass without delay. 
Special thanks to Senator Lubicon Benson as the sponsor of the bill in the other place, and to Parliamentary Secretary G Gary and Angry, whose wise counsel, relationships, and hard work have been invaluable to getting us to this historic day. We will wor continue to work in partnership to put the declaration into action to close socioeconomic gaps, advance reconciliation, and renew relationships based on the affirmation of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. It will be generational work. It will involve the voices of Indigenous peoples, Indigenous youth, women, gender diverse and two-spirited people, communities, and experts. It will involve treaty groups, modern treaty and self-governing nations, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis partners from coast to coast to coast. Guided by the spirit of the Declaration, together we will build a better Canada for all Indigenous peoples and all Canadians. Miigwech, Kuyanamik, Marci, thank you, merci. Merci beaucoup, Ministre Bennett. I will now turn it over to Assembly of First Nations National Chief, Perry Belgard. National Chief. Thank you. Mr. Territory. Um, just thanking you all as relatives and friends and acknowledging the Algonquins uh, here in Ottawa and on their ancestral lands that I'm speaking from. I also said I'm from Little Black Bear First Nations in Treaty 4 Territory, Southern Saskatchewan, and acknowledging the Creator for another beautiful day, giving thanks for this beautiful day. I also want to uh, thank the elders for their prayers and their guidance, their good words, to remind us all that we're all related, we're all connected, and as well to pray for those healing hands to be placed uh, on Mother Earth, but as well our little children, those little ones. So I thank you so much for your good words, all of you. Uh, in guiding us and starting off in a good way. Okay. To Minister Lamedi and Bennett, I greet you, and as well to my colleagues, President Nathan Obed and Vice President Chartran and Chief Willie Littlechild, thank you all so much for your leadership and partnership. Uh, this is uh, a very historic moment today, and I acknowledge all the leaders and champions who worked for so long, first, to have the declaration adopted at the United Nations, and then to have the implementation legislation adopted into Canadian law here in Canada. I do want to acknowledge Romeo Saganash, whose private member's bill, Bill C-262, provided the model for Bill C-15 and played such an important role in building the momentum to get this legislation passed. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Minister Lamedi for your leadership and your commitment to tabling this legislation that's at least as strong as Bill C-262 and as well to acknowledge Senator Patty Labucan Benson championing Bill C-15 in the Senate, and all the senators and members of Parliament who have stood with us to get this very important piece of legislation passed. The UN Declaration is a powerful tool for protecting and realizing the inherent rights and treaty rights of First Nations. This bill is a powerful tool for building a better relationship with Canada in which those rights, our rights, must be respected and upheld and implemented. And it is part of our roadmap to reconciliation in this country. And during the time that this bill and its predecessors have been before Parliament, Canadians have been reminded again and again of the profound and urgent need for real and lasting justice for Indigenous <laughs> peoples. Dealing with systemic racism and discrimination, we all know, needs systemic solution. That's what's required in the healthcare system and the justice system, the educational system across the board. This is a day to acknowledge our collective accomplishments and acknowledge that implementation legislation is long overdue. There's a lot of hard work ahead of us. And I am grateful for the fact that Parliament has realized that this urgent work must not be delayed any longer. The passage of Bill C-15 into law is the first step. First Nations people are eager 
to get to work on bringing the UN Declaration to life in Canada. I'm excited to hear those two words, royal assent. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much, National Chief Belgard. I will now turn uh, the mic over to President of the Inuit Kapirat Kanatabi, uh, Natan Obed. Nakumik, thank you. Ulakut, <clears throat> everyone. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. I want to first thank the elders for your opening uh, prayers. <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize my fellow uh, Indigenous leaders, National Chief Perry Belgard, um, President Chartrand. <clears throat> uh, it's so good to be here on this stage after spending so much time working and advocating um, for this particular moment in this particular day with both of you. Also, I would like to recognize uh, Minister Levetti and Minister Bennett. I want to thank you both for your dedication and your leadership on this file. And a truly um, open process through Bill C-15 to improve the legislation um, up until the day that it was introduced for first reading. So I do want to recognize <clears throat> how difficult that might have been for the institution, for Canada and for the Canadian government to work with Indigenous leadership um, and co-develop this piece of legislation that uh, we see here today before us um, receiving royal assent. Inuit welcome Bill C-15 and applaud Canada for showing leadership by being the first country to pass legislation intended to implement the UN Declaration. This particular piece of legislation will likely influence how other nations prioritize and approach implementation of the UN Declaration globally. I think it's very important to recognize uh, that this is something that shows Canadian leadership towards reconciliation, and it shows leadership towards the ability for Canada to recognize that Indigenous rights are human rights. The difficult conversations that we have had as a nation over the past months, uh, whether it's Kamloops or whether it is um, announcing the National Action Plan for Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, or the ongoing conversations uh, about reconciliation in this country, are grounded in the opposite, that the state, the churches, the police force, the justice system, the education system, the healthcare systems did not accept that Indigenous people's rights were human rights. This piece of legislation and the implementation of the UN Declaration uh, in Canada will push back against that colonial narrative and that colonial perception and is um, something that I'm very proud to be a part of. This particular bill's impacts will be largely determined by the contents of the action plan um, in section two of this legislation, and also the first action plan development process will be essential in charting a positive and constructive path towards the implementation of this legislation. We look forward to working with Justice Canada and the Canadian government in managing the development and implementation of the action plan in a way that goes beyond um, the traditional sense of consultation and truly sees First Nations, Inuit and Métis as partners in this development. We also recognize that the effectiveness of Bill C-15 depends upon the development and implementation of a mechanism for enforcing the rights affirmed by the UN Declaration. In Section 2B of this piece of legislation, there is a reference to recourse and remedy. 
C, Bill C-15 can only be effective if the human rights it affirms are also enforceable. We look forward to working with this government to ensure that when human rights are violated, that Indigenous peoples have a specific place to go for recourse and remedy, to push back against the systems that have not pushed back when um, Indigenous peoples' human rights have been violated in the past. Bill C-15 provides an opportunity to close legal and policy gaps that contribute to human rights violations against Inuit. It's another tool that we now can use to leverage and address long-standing human rights violations, including in the areas of housing, education, healthcare, language, and justice systems. These are all uh, things that will take time, but we now have a platform and foundation that we did not have yesterday. Another tool to ensure that the rights of our people are upheld in Canada. Thank you so much to everyone who um, fought for this legislation that uh, um, went above and beyond from the very beginning to ensure that we are here today. And I also want to close by thanking all of those Inuit who were involved in the creation of the declaration at the United Nations level through the Inuit Circumpolar Council and through other Inuit governance mechanisms that also uh, provided this foundation that we are standing on today. Thank you very much, President Obed. Je cède maintenant la parole à Métis National Council Vice President David Chartrand. Vice President Chartrand? Thank you very much. And uh, let me start off by, of course, acknowledging the elders for your wisdom and your prayers and the message in your prayers. I take uh, prayers from elders very seriously, and I listen to the words that are being spoken, the message that's being given to us. And I want to, of course, thank my my good friends, Perry Villagard, National Grand Chief, and, of course, Natan, a very good friend of mine from the Inuit, uh, for being working together as a team uh, and and. Even though we had our differences, we have our different issues we speak of in our meetings as we moved on UNDRIP, we always came with a consensual view of, of this needs to come forward for, for a better Canada. Minister Lamedi, of course, I want to thank you for all your work. And Minister Bennett, I want to thank you for all your work. And all those in, in Parliament and Senate, I want to thank you again for doing the right thing and getting this passed. And there's one more person I want to thank, and that's, of course, the Prime Minister. Uh, you know, he never wavered from his commitment to Indigenous people. And he's kept his promise. And it's uh, reconciliation to him is not a buzzword. It has meaning. And we're seeing the benefit of that caliber of leadership that's making it very clear we need to make, find change for Indigenous people in this country. I look behind my shoulders and I see Riel. And I think about 1870 and I think about what happened to the Indigenous people. First Indigenous government to ever bring uh, a province into confederation, and I look back and I reflect upon Treaty 1 that came after that in 1871, and all the treaties that come after that in the prairies. And I ask myself the question, imagine for for just a moment if we can reflect that under it would have been passed, and that we would have been treated with respect, and treated as human beings and people of value, and instead of being treated as less human and that we need to change and strip us of our culture and identity. Just imagine if UNDRIP was actually real in 1874, where the Indigenous people would be today in this country that we actually own. So it is really reflective of the thought that even though it's taken us several hundred years to get where we are with more respect to Indigenous people, I think we're in the right pathway. I think UNDRIP is the, is the clear passageway. There are still people opposed to it, uh, people using it for a tool, political tool. And, and I know one thing, it's a win, win, win. Uh, we as Indigenous people are going to win with this strongly. Industry, uh, investors are going to win with this because now they'll have more confidence when they're investing in natural resources in our territories. And, and again, Canadians are going to win because at the end of the day, we'll find ability as government to government and nation to nation to sit down at a table equally understanding each other. This is a blueprint. And for those that use it as a tool of, of, of fear-mongering, 
this is not a veto. We don't, we're not out there to kill industry. We're not there to kill anything. We're there to protect the environment, I assure you that. But we're there also to build the economy of our nation and in an equal partnership, in a process where we're all benefiting, all of us, not just one, one group. And the rest, of course, Indigenous people are the ones losing out at the end. So this is a change maker. This is a, something that's going to be, uh, that we'll reflect on. Hopefully I'll live another 20 years and I'll be able to reflect back a quarter of a century from now and say, wow, we, I was there. I was help lobbying that. I was, I was speaking in different functions in front of the Senate, pushing ministers, pushing those opposition. I do know the Conservatives, uh, unfortunately, many Premier Conservatives are opposed to this uh, at this point in time. But I think they'll come on once they see the blueprint in action and once they see industry was also echoing the sentiments that it gives them a better understanding of how they move forward on investments. And any investor wants to know that they, if they're going to put their money in the business, they know they need to trust it. They can't be risking all their money and then find out it's it's not going to move or it's not, nothing's going to be built. So it's very clear this blueprint is going to start the fabric of how we come together and I, I can say over and over thank you uh, government of canada thank you canada uh for for finally making change to where we need to go so on behalf of the Métis nation on, be, and, and on behalf of my president clement Chartier, who actually worked with wilton a little child many times at the united nation he did his part and wilton you're you're still here to me and when we go to rome one day we'll travel again together so but i want to make it very clear for the Métis nation we are proud of this country and we're definitely proud to be part of this and we are very supportive of this uh, this, this declaration that's coming in legislation. And I said, as Perry Belgard said, it doesn't become fully until it royal assent. Then we all will jump in joy uh, that the change is finally there and we, we played a role in that. So thank you very much to all those that participants uh, participate in this, this historic event that's taking place this morning. Merci beaucoup, uh, uh, Mr. Chaltrand. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Dr. Willie Littlechild. Over to you, sir. Chief Littlechild? Wondering if you have your mic on? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm safe. I'm so contented. I'm going to see my tonista. And that's come out. I go. I saw him for a minute. I saw him in a minute. My can't move. Tell me, I'm so tired. Go to. Go to you. That I'm sad now. Hello and greetings to everyone in my Cree language. First, I want to thank the great spirit, God, however you acknowledge our creator for today's special blessings. My Cree name is Wolf Walker from Muscochis. And thank you to our spiritual leaders for their opening prayers and the dedication to the child's spirit. Thank you to my family, also to all of you for your leadership, contributions, and participation in shaping of a legislative path to reconciliation. The Muscochis elders, leaders, and supporters all these years stated, all we want is recognition, respect, and justice. Many are gone now on their spirit journey who worked on the UN and the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Their dream and my goal was treaty implementation, honor, respect, and enforcement of a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship. As a former commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, in an effort to restore respectful relationships we urged consideration of calls to action. We stated, based on the largest consultation in Canadian history and a key for success, the first principle ought to be the call on us 
to adopt the UN Declaration as the framework for reconciliation. As you know, the four pillars of the UN Declaration are first, the inherent right to self-determination. Secondly, culture, lands, territories, and resources. And fourthly, consent, all of which individually and collectively advance having good relations with Tusky Win or peaceful coexistence when seen through a positive lens or perspective. Similarly, the Bill C-15 at the outset in Preambler Paragraph 1 and others focuses on a very important instruction, the focus on the reconciliation framework, which promotes a positive start and to working together towards being well, also on healing from harms of the past. The significant objective of peace in particular to the treaties of peace and friendship. The highlights of our elders and ceremonial guidance all are through our work to find solutions. These were the principles. Finally, authentic. It's not perfect. So it's with gratitude to all who fully and respectfully debated, albeit in challenging times, as we heard from both sides, as it, in the important aspect of informed and free prior and informed consent. We now take the best from each and focus on the next important and critical step, developing together an action plan, building on the strengths of our peoples, spirituality, and by working together to advance reconciliation. Now the work begins. Let's take the best of what we heard and felt and shape the best Canada can be, a country where we have good relations. The rest of Canada, Let's put our differences aside, because as my friend, President Chartrand said, when Indigenous peoples win, Canada wins, and indeed, the whole world wins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Littlechild. Our moderator is having um, some technical difficulties and will rejoin soon. But I think at this point, we are um, able to go to questions. Thank you, Chief Littlechild. Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile maintenant pour poser une question. And the first question is from Jorge Barrera from CBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is for um, Minister Lametti. Will, will your department be providing the 4,000 or some litigation records related to residential <laughs> schools and any other residential school records uh, to the NCTR? Um, this is one of the things that the TRC were never, never able to obtain, but I'm just wondering if this is something uh, the department would do now. Well, thank you for that question. We we certainly have been committed uh, to to 
to being as open as possible with documentation with documentation in the past. Uh, that included that that included going to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, to to litigate that documents should never be destroyed. Uh, we lost that case, but we're still working. Uh, we're still working to to move uh, to make sure that anybody who needs access to documents uh, for for the purposes of uh, of compensation or other purposes has that access. So we'll continue. I don't. I don't. Uh, I will study this uh, in more uh, with more care. I'm not sure particularly to what you're referring, but but certainly I'm willing to to look at those uh, questions. And in principle, we we do believe uh, in access to documents. Yeah, Justice Canada has all the litigation from all the civil cases that were filed before the settlement agreement. Um, and just a second question on the reparations uh, class action that will now proceed now that the base callers issue has been settled. Um, why does the government continue to argue in its filings that it had it did not ever mean to aim to destroy language and culture? And is reparation something that the government will now be willing to negotiate a settlement for? Look again. I'm not going to talk about any particular case uh, because I can't, as Attorney General. Uh, that being said, uh, we believe in the principle of, of trying uh, to resolve cases, uh, litigation, reparations uh, by agreement where possible. Uh, we have we have recognized uh, as a government on more than one occasion systemic racism. We've recognized the wrongs that have happened. Uh, and we're doing our best on a number of different fronts, uh, a number of different uh, ministers, uh, to to try to help uh, resolve those uh, those issues, whether it be uh, through negotiations or, or uh, with respect to uh, my Justice Department. And I would also just point out finally that that we are we are uh, working every day to implement the litigation directive uh, that my predecessor, uh, Minister Jody Wilson Raybould, uh, brought in while she was minister. And we're trying to live by those principles. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Olivia Stefanovic from CBC News. Please go ahead. Thank you. This is a question for Minister Lametti. The, the Assembly of First Nations says your government's continued narrow definition of Jordan's principle is part of racist colonial policies. So why won't your government change, change its position on this? And I'm also wondering if the federal court re rejects your ju judicial review on the child welfare case involving Indigenous children, is your government prepared to respect that decision and pay the full compensation? Um, I, I'm not going to comment on the particulars of either a case uh, or the negotiations that are ongoing under the under the leadership of, of my colleague, Minister Mark Miller. Uh, what I will say is that we are trying uh, to resolve those issues, uh, working with the AFN, working with other uh, litigants in the two class actions, um, and uh, we are proceeding with the judicial review in, in the federal court uh, for what we feel are, are very legitimate reasons as well. So we are working in good faith to resolve those issues. The Prime Minister, Minister Miller, have both said publicly uh, that we will compensate uh, those uh, those Indigenous children who were taken away from their families, and we're working very hard uh, in order to do that. Thank you. And my next question is for National Chief Belgard. About a quarter of all COVID-19 cases in Indigenous communities across the country are in Kisechewan First Nation right now. Okay. I'm wondering what concerns you have about this particular outbreak. And I also want to know, since leaders in the community say that the federal government, they say the federal government was slow to respond, that it did not send rapid tests or isolation units right away, is that acceptable in your view? Well, thank you for the, the question, Livia. And, um... First thing, I did talk to Chief Leo Friday uh, a few days ago, and there's 232 cases uh, of COVID-19, and it's affecting uh, children and babies. And so we know it's a it's a it's an epidemic, it's a travesty. The issue really is overcrowded housing. There's 20 people in a house, 
And so he's asked for our help to ensure that we put as much pressure on the federal government to ensure that all red tape is put to the side and that proper housing, access potable water, proper PPE are put in place to deal with that crisis, getting Department of National Defense up there as soon as possible. Um, and so we're going to keep advocating for that. Uh, we always say things are moving. Uh, things can always be improved upon and move, move faster, and that's our job as AFNs to advocate for that. And uh, again, we're going to keep pushing uh, to make sure that those needs are met. Proper health care is very key, and uh, it's important. So that's where that rests. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Teresa White, the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Good morning. Um, my first question is for Minister Lametti. Um, just picking up on an earlier question, uh, you said Ottawa would prefer to compensate First Nations kids harmed by the child welfare system through the two class action lawsuits. Do you not think that this is the very definition of a colonialist approach with Ottawa telling First Nations the way they would prefer to pay damages? Or to pay damages? Well, look, all the structures involved, including the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, are colonialist structures, and, and hopefully that's something, as, as President Obed referred to, uh, down the road that we can uh, that we can work to remedy. Uh, through the action plan and beyond, with a, with a different kind of accountability mechanism. That being said, we we as I have as I have intimated, as Minister Miller has said, we are working with uh, the uh, various uh, uh, leadership groups and plaintiffs in those class actions uh, in order to fairly uh, compensate uh, those children. Um, and as I have also intimated, we feel that there were serious problems in the manner in which uh, the, uh, the compensation ruling from the CHRT came out. And so uh, we are moving in good faith uh, to try to uh, negotiate uh, a, a fair resolution, as we have done with, with residential school survivors, as we have done with day scholars and, and a number of, uh, 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 on a number of other different occasions. Um, and I think as a government, we have done, I think we have pushed the envelope in a positive direction on a number of, of uh, these outstanding uh, claims and cases, and we're continuing to do so in a wide variety of areas. Um, thank you. Uh, and National Chief Bellegarde, um, there were changes made to this bill after calls from Indigenous leaders to overtly reject the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. Can you tell me why you mm -hmm. um, think that this was important to have, like why this language was important to include in the preamble? And also, if I may, uh, I know that Chief Littlechild was instrumental in adding language also to the preamble um, to acknowledge and recognize existing treaty rights. If he would be able to sort of tell us why he thought that was also important to be included in the legislation, I would love to hear that as well. Thank you for that question. And, um, you know, with the passage of Bill C-15, after it achieves royal assent, you know, it's clear that it denounces, it's a denunciation of racist uh, and uh, illegal doctrines used to deny our rights, inherent rights, Aboriginal rights, and treaty rights. And that's a doctrine of discovering the doctrine of Cornelius. And uh, those two doctrines are fastly be becoming, not only in Canada, but globally as illegal racist doctrines. And so to have them mentioned in there uh, is very powerful about decolonizing uh, Canada's laws and policies. So as part of the National Action Plan, You've got to update, for example, four outdated policies, comprehensive claims policy, specific claims policy, additions to reserve policy, and the inherent right to self-government policy. Are basically are all currently on based on denial of inherent rights, Aboriginal rights and title and jurisdiction and treaty rights. And so with a recognition uh, uh, and a reference to the doctrine of uh, discovery and the doctrine of terra nullius uh, as illegal race doctrine, things have to be brought in line. And, and that's something we've been talking about for, for years and years and years. So this is a, a powerful tool about our rights recognition and implementation. And getting the policies in line with this now is very fundamental uh, to really building reconciliation in Canada. 
And so we look forward to getting this work started and done. It'll have a huge impact because uh, as even in our treaty relationship, it was always about always about peaceful coexistence and mutual respect and sharing this great land and sharing these resources. We've never surrendered or given up anything. And that's fundamental to this going forward. Chief Little Child, did you want to respond to the question? Not sure if you have your mic open. I believe it is, uh, if you can hear me. I think that's a very important question. Uh, for myself as an individual in particular, because that was the exact reason, or one of the exact reasons why the elders and our leaders from Muscotis asked me to go and become engaged in the international arena. By that I mean it was treaty violations in August 1977 with their concerns about the daily violations of our treaties, that they wanted me to go back to the international arena to remind the world, they said, that we have international uh, agreements, partnerships, and also very importantly, that they understand or they must understand there's two sides to treaty, but the written part of treaty is all we had heard about until recently when the Supreme Court of Canada declared that the oral testimony, how we as Indigenous peoples, tribes, and nations understand treaty, is has, has to be given equal legal weight as the written text. So treaties, the violations of our sacred agreements is why we went there and we proposed solutions and one of which is a very uh, legislation we're talking about today. Thank you so much. Uh, operator, do we have another question? Thank you, merci. There are no further questions we're just at this time. No, 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 plus de questions pour le moment. I would now like to turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you, merci beaucoup. So thank you everyone. Uh, that is the end of the press conference. Merci encore d'avoir participé aujourd'hui. Si vous avez des questions au sujet de l'annonce faite aujourd'hui, veuillez communiquer avec les relations avec les médias du ministère de la Justice à l'adresse suivante, media.justice.gc.ca. If you have any further questions about today's announcement, please contact the Department of Justice Media Relations at media at justice.gc.ca. I'd like to thank everyone and wish you a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Merci. You. The conference has now ended. The conference is now terminated.